Hey there, it's Shannon Magic Myers, and today we are looking at section 4.1 from the Zill Intro Differential Equations text. And this is a lot of theory, so just be warned. <laughs> Some preliminary theory about linear equations. So we'll be checking out a bunch of different stuff. You can read about that up there. And let's start out with initial value and boundary value problems. So an initial value problem for a linear differential equation, an nth order initial value problem, IVP, is a situation where we want to solve a sub n at x times the nth derivative of y with respect to x plus a sub n minus 1 at x times the n minus first derivative of y with respect to x and then you keep going until we get to a1 at x times dy dx plus a0 at x times y is equal to some g at x subject to y at x0 equal to y0 y prime at x0 equal to y1 and continuing down the line until we got to the n minus first derivative of y at x0 equal to y sub n minus 1. Now recall for this type of problem we seek a function defined on some interval i containing x0 that satisfies the differential equation and the n initial conditions specified at x0. So again, y at x0 would equal to some y0, y prime at x0 equal to y1, all the way down to y at that m minus first derivative at x0 equal to y sub n minus 1. We have already observed that in the case of a second order initial value problem, a solution curve must pass through the point x0, y0, and have slope y1 at this point. So our first theorem, 4.1.1, is about the existence of a unique solution. So let A sub n at x, comma, A sub n minus 1 at x, all the way down to A1 at x, A0 at x, and g at x be continuous on some interval i, and let a sub n at x not be equal to zero for every x in this interval. If x equal to x zero is any point in the interval, then a solution y at x of the initial value problem Again, these are the same equations we wrote up there. Exists on the interval and is unique. All right, so in our first example, the given family of functions is the general solution of the differential equation on the indicated interval. Find a member of the family that is a solution of the initial value problem. So let's just take a look at what we've got. Y prime, 
will be equal to what? Good, the C1 zeroes out. We'll get negative C2 times sine at x plus C3 times cosine at x. Y double prime is equal to, working with that first one, we'll have negative C2 times cosine at x minus C3 times sine at x. So now let's take a look at some of these initial conditions. So we have y up there. Let's work with y double prime at pi is negative 1. So y double prime at pi is negative 1. Working with that initial condition, we would have negative 1 equals to negative c2 times cosine of pi minus c3 times sine at pi. Negative 1 would be negative c2 times negative 1, because cosine of pi is negative 1. Sine of pi zeroes out, so that will go away. And then c2, after you sort through all of the negatives, is going to be negative 1. Now working with y prime, going back over here, we'll have y prime is equal to, oops, sorry, we're looking at y prime at pi would equal to negative c2 times sine at pi plus c3 times cosine at pi. We've also been given that y prime at pi is 2. Now sine at pi zeroes out, so we'll have 2 is equal to c3 times negative 1. And again, that's because of this right here. And so c3 will end up being equal to negative 2. Good so far? All right, jump to a different color here. Now, y is equal to c1 plus c2 cosine at x plus c3 times sine at x. So y at pi would be c1 plus c2 times cosine at pi plus c3 times sine at pi. It's also been given that y at pi is 0, and that will give us that 0 is equal to c1 plus c2 times negative 1. That third term will 0 out, so we'll get 0 equals c1 minus c2. So c1 is equal to c2, but we know that c2 is equal to negative 1, so c C1 would also be equal to negative 1. And here we used the fact that y at pi was 0, just so you can see. And then we also plugged in this fact here that c at 2 was negative 1. So at the end of the day, we end up with y equals c1, which is negative 1, minus, I'm putting the minus in because c2 is negative 1, so we'll get minus cosine at x, and then c3 was negative 2, so we'll have minus 2 times sine at x, and that's over the same interval and we're good to go. All right, so now let's take a look at boundary value problems. So another type of problem consists of solving a linear differential equation 
of order two or greater in which the dependent variable y or its derivatives are specified at different points. So we would be solving a sub 2 at x times the second derivative of y with respect to x plus a sub 1 at x times dy dx plus a 0 at x times y is equal to sum g at x subject to y at a equals to y0 and y at b is equal to y1. It's called a boundary value problem. BVP. The prescribed values y at b equal to y1 and y at a equal to y0 are called boundary conditions. Shortened by bc. All right, homogeneous equations. A linear nth order differential equation of the form a sub n at x times the nth derivative of y with respect to x plus a sub n minus 1 at x times the n minus first derivative of y with respect to x plus dot 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 plus a sub 1 at x times dy dx plus a sub 0 at x equal to 0 is said to be homogeneous. Whereas an equation, basically the same thing, <laughs> so a sub n at x times that nth derivative of y with respect to x plus a sub n minus 1 at x times the n minus first derivative of y with respect to x plus dot 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 plus a1 at x times dy dx plus a0 at x equal to g at x with g at x not 0 is said to be non-homogeneous. So to solve a non-homogeneous equation, we first need to solve the associated homogeneous equation. For the remainder of this course, we'll make the following assumptions when stating definitions and theorems about linear equations. We'll be solving all of this stuff here, that a sub n at x times that nth derivative of y with respect to x plus a sub n minus 1 at x times the n minus first derivative, etc., um, all the way down to a sub 0 at x times y equal to g at x subject to y at x 0 equal to y 0, y prime at x 0 equal to y 1, all the way down to the n minus first derivative of y at x 0 is equal to y sub n minus 1 on some common interval i the coefficient functions a sub i at x for i equal to 0, 1, 2, all the way to n, and g at x are continuous, and a sub n at x 
is not equal to zero for every x in the interval. Differential operators. In calculus, differentiation is often denoted by d. So, sorry about that, <laughs> dy dx equals to d sub y. The symbol d is called a differential operator because it transforms a differentiable function into another function. So if you have d tangent at x, that would be, of course, what? Beautiful secant squared at x. And then this next one would denote the second derivative of tangent at x, which would be d dx of our secant squared at x, the result of what we had just gotten, which is equal to, beautiful, 2 times secant at x to the 1 using our chain rule, and then times the derivative of secant at x, which is secant at x times tangent at x, which of course would be 2 times secant squared at x times tangent at x. So in general, an nth order differential operator or polynomial operator is defined as L equals to A sub N at X times that nth derivative of Y plus A sub N minus 1 at X times that N minus first derivative of Y plus dot 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 plus a 1 sub 1 at x times that first derivative plus a 0 at x. So if I'm differentiating c times some, some constant c times a function of x, that's equal to c times the derivative of that function of x where c is a constant. And if you've got the derivative of a sum of functions, you would get the sum of the derivatives. The differential operator L has a linearity property. L operating on a linear combination, so if you've taken linear algebra, you might have seen that, of two differential functions is the same as the linear combination of L operating on the individual functions. So, L at alpha times f at x plus some beta times g at x is equal to alpha times L at f of x plus beta times L times g of x, where alpha and beta are constants. Thus, the nth order differential operator L is a linear operator. All right, differential equations. So here's what it looks like. If you have some equation, let's say we have 6y, the fourth derivative, times the fourth, 6 times the fourth derivative of y. 
minus 7 times y triple prime plus a 3y double prime plus y equals maybe 2x minus 7. I'm just making it up. So this could be written as 6 times d4 at y minus 7 times d3 of y plus 3 times d2 of y plus y equals 2x minus 7. Now, factoring out a y to the right, we would have 6d4, that fourth derivative, minus 7d3 plus 3d2 plus 1, all of that times y would equal to 2x minus 7. So if you have something along the lines of a sub n at x times the nth derivative of y with respect to x plus a sub n minus 1 at x times the n minus first derivative of y with respect to x plus dot 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 plus a1 at x times dy dx plus a0 at x equal to 0 would simply be l at y is 0. Isn't that nice? Beautiful. And then if you do the same thing here, all right, same thing. So a sub n at x times that nth derivative of y with respect to x plus a sub n minus 1 at x times the n minus first derivative of y with respect to x plus dot 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 plus a sub 1 at x times dy dx plus a sub 0 at x equal to g of x now, non-homogeneous, would give us l at y is g at x. Cool, cool? All right, moving right along. We have a superposition principle. So the sum or superposition of two or more solutions of a homogeneous linear differential equation is also a solution. So we've got a theorem for this superposition principle for homogeneous equations. Let y1, y2, all the way down to y sub n be solutions of the homogeneous nth order differential equation a sub n at x times that nth derivative of y with respect to x plus a sub n minus 1 all the way down to a sub 0 at x times y equal to 0 on an interval i. All right? So y1, y2, all the way to yn are solutions of that. Then the linear combination y equals c1 times y1 at x plus c2 times y2 at x plus dot 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 plus ck times y sub k at x where the ci i equal 1, 2, 3, all the way down to k, our arbitrary constants, is also a solution on the interval. So that's pretty amazing, right? So if you have all of these solutions, the linear combination of all the solutions, or a linear combination of all the solutions, or all possible <laughs> linear combinations of the solutions are also a solution. All right, so we're just going to prove this for k equal to 2. So if we let 
L, B, the differential operator, defined by L equals A sub N at X, DN plus A sub N minus one at X, DN minus one plus dot 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 plus A one at X, D plus A zero at X, Y, and let y1 at x and y2 at x be solutions of the homogeneous equation L at Y equal to zero. So defining Y equal to C1 Y1 at X plus C2 Y2 at X, we have L at Y is equal to L at C1 Y1 at X plus C2 Y2 at X. Actually, I'll put different grouping symbol on there. But this will be equal to C1 times L at Y1 plus C2 times L at Y2 by linearity of L. And we're done. All right, so there's a couple corollaries to this theorem. Um, a, a constant multiple, y equal to c1 times y1 at x of a solution, y1 at x of a homogeneous linear differential equation is also a solution, which is cool. And B, a homogeneous linear differential equation always possesses the trivial solution. Y is zero. So, what does this mean? Well, if you have the function Y equal to E to the seven X is a solution of y double prime plus 9y prime plus 14y equal to 0. So that's given. So what does that mean? This means that any constant times that is also a solution. So, I don't know, y equal to maybe 12e to the 7x y equal to negative e to the 7x any constant times that you know, could even be a radical y equal to root 13e to the 7x all of them are all solutions. 
They're all solutions. Yay. <laughs> I'll take that out so you don't get confused. All right, here we go. Linear dependence and linear independence. So definition, linear dependence, independence. A set of functions, f1 at x, f2 at x, all the way down to f sub n at x is said to be linearly dependent on an interval i if there exists constants c1, c2, all the way down to cn, which are not all zero, such that c1 times f1 at x plus c2 times f2 at x plus dot 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 plus c sub n times f n at x equals zero for every x in the interval. If the set of functions is not linearly dependent on the interval, it is said to be linearly independent. So note, if at least one of the functions, f1 at x, whoops, comma, f2 at x, dot, 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 fn at x, can be expressed as a linear combination of the remaining functions, the set is linearly dependent. So looking at these functions here, I see that we've got a cosine 2x for function 1 and a, a 1 for function 2. And I know that cosine squared at x is equal to 1 half plus 1 half times cosine 2x. So if I doubled that function, I would get 1 plus cosine at 2x. Good so far? And so here, 1 times f1 at x plus 1 times f2 at x, isn't that equal to 2 times f3 at x? Or, equivalently, 1 half times f1 of x plus 1 half times f2 at x is equal to f3 at x. So I was able to express f3 at x as a, as a linear combination of the other two functions. And so this set is linearly dependent. All right, solutions of differential equations. So this first definition here is a definition for the Ronskian. Suppose each of the functions f1 at x, f2 at x, all the way down to f n at x possesses at least n minus 1 derivatives. Well, it turns out that the determinant w at f1, f2, all the way down to f n, or the Ronskian of these functions, is equal to the determinant of f, f2, all the way down to fn and then you've got f prime at 1 or f1 sorry f1 prime 
and then all the way down to the n minus first derivative of f1. Same with f2, you'd go take all these derivatives, you'd have f the n minus first derivative of f2, and you'd keep it going. You'd have the first derivative of fn, and then all the way down to the n minus first derivative of f sub n, where the primes denote derivatives is called the Ronskian of the function. All right, so criterion for linearly independent solutions. If we let y1, y2, all the way down to y sub n be n solutions of the homogeneous linear nth order differential equation, all of this good stuff that we've been reading, <laughs> a sub n at x times that nth derivative of y with respect to x, all the way down to a sub 0 at x times y, all equal to 0 on an interval i. If that's the case, then the set of solutions is linearly independent on the interval if and only if the Ronskian of these solutions is non-zero for every x in the interval. All right, so now next theorem, fundamental set of solutions. So any set y1, y2, all the way down to y sub n of n linearly independent solutions of the homogeneous linear nth order differential equation, a sub n at x times the nth derivative of a y with respect to x, plus a sub n minus 1 at x, times the n minus first derivative of y with respect to x, all the way down to a sub 0 at x times y equal to 0 on an interval, i is said to be a fundamental, this is a good one, fundamental set of solutions. So, if you've got a set of linearly independent solutions to a homogeneous linear nth order of differential equation, um, it, then it's said to be a fundamental set of solutions. All right, so this next example, we want to verify that the given functions form a fundamental set of solutions of the differential equation on the indicated interval. So we have 4y double prime minus 4y prime plus y equal to 0, and e to the x over 2 and x e to the x over 2 are functions that form a fundamental set. All right, so what do we do? Well, let's find the Ronskian of this set of solutions. that will equal to, so let's do a little side work here. So ddx of e to the x over 2 equals 1 half e to the x over 2. And we're only going to need one derivative because we have just two functions. And then ddx of x e to the x over 2 is equal to x over 2 e to the x over 2 plus plus e to the x over 2 which in turn is e to the x over 2 times x over 2 plus 1. Cool so far? All right. So now let's make our wrong, our wrong skin. <laughs> so we have the original functions, e to the x over 2, and their, and their first derivatives. So we'll have 1 half 
e to the x over 2. And then this next one will be x e to the x over 2. And that derivative was e to the x over 2 times x over 2 plus 1. So now this determinant will be equal to e to the x over 2 times e to the x over 2 times the quantity x over 2 plus 1 minus x e to the x over 2 times 1 half e to the x over 2, which is e to the x over 2 times e to the x over 2 is just e to the x. And then distributing it through, we'll have e to the x times e to the x times quantity x over 2 plus 1. And then minus x over 2 times e to the x. Factoring out e to the x, we'll have x over 2 plus 1 minus x over 2, which just gives us e to the x which is not ever equal to zero. So, therefore, what does that mean? We just found out that we have a second order differential equation, homogeneous differential equation, all right? We have two linearly independent solutions. And so therefore, these guys form a fundamental set, right? So since we have a second order DE and two linearly independent solutions the set e to the x over 2 and x e to the x over 2 form a fundamental set of solutions. All right, cool, cool. All right, existence of a fundamental set. Getting closer. <laughs> All right, so here we go. There exists a fundamental set of solutions for the homogeneous linear nth order differential equation. A sub n at x times the nth derivative of y with respect to x plus a sub n minus 1 at x times the nth minus first derivative of y with respect to x all the way down to a1 at x times dy dx plus a0 at x times y equal to 0 on an interval i. And then the general solution for homogeneous equations. Let y1, y2, all the way down to y, and be a fundamental set. So they're given to be a fundamental set of solutions of the homogeneous linear nth order differential equation. We've read it 5,000 times this time. I'll just let you read it. Um, all this good stuff equal to zero on an interval i. Then, the general solution of the equation on the interval is y equals to c1 
times y1 at x plus c2 times y2 at x all the way down to cn times y sub n at x where the ci for i equal 1, 2, all the way down to n are arbitrary constants. So it's really pretty cool because that problem, you know, that we just worked on, um, that what that means, so let's go back to it, what that means is that y equal to c1 e to the x over 2 plus c2 x e to the x over 2 is a general solution. Or is the general solution. of the DE. Pretty cool, huh? All right, so let's look at the proof for this one. If we let Y be a solution, and again, we're just going to go for K equal to 2, and let Y1 and Y2 be linearly independent. Solutions. Of A2 Y double prime plus A1 Y prime plus A0 y equal to zero on an interval i for which the wrong scan of y1 and y2 we'll make those in terms of t y1 at t and y2 at t is not equal to zero because of the fact that they're linearly independent, y1 and y2. And that y at t is equal to k1 and y prime at t is equal to k2. So we have C1 times Y1 at T plus C2 times Y2 at T would equal to K. And C1 times Y1 prime at T plus C2 times Y2 prime at T. Oh, sorry, that was K1, and this one would be K2. Cool so far? So since Y1 and Y2 are independent, are linearly independent, we know that the wrong skin is non-zero. So Y1 at T y1 prime at t, y2 at t, and y2 prime at t, that determinant is not zero. And what is this? It is the Ronskian of y1 and y2. What's different? Where? Beautiful, x is equal to t. 
So if we define g at x equal to this linear combination, in terms of x, we since g at x is a superposition, a sum, of two known solutions, G at x satisfies the differential equation. G at x also satisfies the initial conditions g at t equal to c1 times y1 at t plus c2 times y2 at t, which is equal to k1, and g prime at t equal to c1 y1 prime at t plus c2 y2 prime at t equal to k2. Now y, capital Y at x, satisfies the same linear equation. and the same initial conditions. But by theorem, four point one point one, we know that the solution of this initial value problem has to be unique, right? So therefore, capital Y at X has to equal to G at X or Y at X equals to C1 Y1 at X plus C2 Y2 at X. And we're done. All right, pretty cool. Good stuff. Now, going on to non-homogeneous equations. So, another theorem, the general solution for a non-homogeneous equation. Let y sub p be any particular solution of the non-homogeneous linear nth order differential equation. Now it's the same as the homogeneous except for instead of being equal to zero, it's equal to g at x on some interval i. And let y1, y2, all the way down to y sub n be a fundamental set of solutions of the associated homogeneous differential equation, all that good stuff, equal to zero on the interval i. Then the general solution of the equation on the interval is y has to equal to c1 times y1 at x plus c2 times y2 at x plus dot 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 plus cn 
times y sub n at x, we've seen that before, right? Plus the particular y sub p at x, where ci for i equal 1, 2, down to n are arbitrary constants. All right, so now let's get into complementary function. So the linear combination y equal to, write that nicer, y equal to c1 times y1 at x plus c2 times y2 at x plus dot 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 plus cn times yn at x, which is the general solution of the homogeneous equation below, is called the complementary function for the equation, the differential equation that is non-homogeneous that's below. So to solve a non-homogeneous linear differential equation, first solve the associated homogeneous linear differential equation and then find any particular solution of the non-homogeneous equation. The general solution of the non-homogeneous equation is then going to be y equal to the complementary function plus any particular solution. So y would equal to y sub c plus y sub p. Now there's a superposition principle for non-homogeneous equations as well. So if we let y sub p1, y sub p2, all the way down to y sub pk, bk, particular solutions of the non-homogeneous linear nth order differential equation, all there, equal to, it's all equal to g of x on an interval i, corresponding in turn to k distinct functions, g1, g2, all the way down to g sub k. So that is, suppose, y sub pi denotes a particular solution of the corresponding differential equation a sub n at x times the nth derivative of y plus a sub n minus 1 at x times the n minus first derivative of y all the way down to a sub 1 at x times y prime plus a sub 0 at x times y equal to g i, sorry, g i at x, where i equals 1, 2, all the way down to k. Then it turns out that y sub p at x is equal to the sum of all of these little particular solutions. y sub p1 at x plus y sub p2 at x plus dot 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 plus y sub pi at x is a particular solution of a sub n at x times the nth derivative of y plus a sub n minus 1 at x 
times the n minus first derivative of y plus dot 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 plus a sub 1 at x times y prime plus a sub 0 at x times y is going to equal to simply g1 at x plus g2 at x plus dot 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 plus gk at x. Cool, cool? All right, so then this last example, we want to verify that the given two-parameter family of functions is the general solution of the non-homogeneous differential equation on the indicated interval. So here, if I look at y1 at x equal to e to the 2x, because remember, it doesn't matter what the constant is, and then y2 at x equal to e to the 5x. Let's take a look at the wrong, wrong scan for that. So the wrong scan for e to the 2x and e to the 5x would be the determinant of e to the 2x. The derivative is below 2e to the 2x. And then we have e to the 5x with its derivative below. Well, that's going to be e to the 2x times e, sorry, 5e to the 5x minus e to the 5x times 2e to the 2x, which is going to be 5e to the 7x minus 2e to the 7x, which is what? Beautiful. 3e to the 7x, which is not 0. Cool? So, what does that mean? y1 equal to e to the 2x and y2 equal to e to the 5x form a fundamental set. of solutions to the homogeneous system y double prime minus 7y prime plus 10y equal to 0. So y sub p at x equal to that last term, 6e to the x, is a particular solution. to the homogeneous system, or the non-homogeneous system. Or non-homogeneous, non-homogeneous system. y double prime minus 7y prime plus 10y equal to 24e to the x. So it's pretty cool. Um, if you actually plugged everything in, what would happen is you would verify, but you don't have to find all those derivatives and plug them in to do so. All right. So anyway, um, I believe that is it. So I hope you have a wonderful morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you're watching this show. And if you like what I'm doing, hey, hit that like button and please subscribe. Bye.